Good morning, Evie Free. My name is Eddie Park. I'm one of the teaching voices on staff. And let's settle this once and for all. I keep getting this question. If you go to our website on our front page, every, everybody asks me, hey, I saw you on the front of our website. <laughs> and I'm trying to settle this once and for all. No, that's just another random Asian guy <laughs> with sweet dance moves, OK? Random Asian guy with sweet dance moves, Eddie Park, Asian millennial pastor, okay? <laughs> sweet moves, millennial pastor. Are we clear? Let's settle that, okay? You know, my, my world turned upside down about a month ago. Uh, I got the opportunity to teach in the worship center on the book of Jonah. And my life has crazily changed. I can't even go to downtown Fullerton at any coffee shop without this happening to me. I promise you. I always get this, hey, Jonah. <laughs> My name's Eddie. <laughs> no, 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 you're the Jonah guy. You're the Jonah guy. <laughs> you know, thank you so much. I, I just want to take an opportunity to, to just thank everyone. Everyone that wrote me an email, um, a Facebook message, a text message. I don't know how you got my number. That's a little scary. Um, but to everyone who sent me encouragement, I just want to say thank you. I tried my best to, to send you a personal response and reply. As a young communicator, this platform is incredibly frightening. And so I'd just like to publicly say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It, was, it was great because I was able to share my heart and I was able to allow this community to kind of know who I am. Um, because it's, it's easy when you don't know someone's heart and if you don't really know who they are, it's easy to be misunderstood. I actually had a conflict uh, this week with one of our coworkers here on staff. Yes, church workers do have interpersonal conflict. And um, I got this text message from him saying, hey, uh, do you have time to meet up this week? And you know when you get a text message or an email from someone you don't normally communicate with quite frequently, and they just send you that random, like, hey, do you have time to talk this week? Like, your, your anxiety level goes a little high. Like, hey, this person, is this person not happy with me? And it ended up being right. Um, <laughs> he, he came to, into my office. I invited him into my office. And we had, we had a talk, and it, it turned out that he, he was harboring some bitter, bitterness towards me. And we haven't had a lot of interaction, but he just kind of compiled a few experiences. And he just said, hey, I just want to confess to you, I've harbored this bitterness towards you. And, and it was great because we were able to share a human moment together. And he was able to see my heart. He was able to understand who I truly was. But it was, it was a misunderstanding. He misunderstood me. And we do this as humans, right? We... we we take just a few interactions or experiences with someone and we just place them into these boxes, right? Like, oh, you, that guy's the angry guy. She's the annoying one. <laughs> this person, he's really sensitive. It's, it's very primal. It's a very survival instinct because it's just so much easier to deal with people by putting them in these categories and boxes. But what ends up happening is people feel mis misunderstood. And that's one of the worst feelings. What saddens me is that there's probably no one more misunderstood than the person of Jesus Christ. It deeply saddens me. There's people in the world that just say he's a myth, that he's fiction, that he's folk folklore. And then there's people that misunderstand Jesus to be like, almost like Santa Claus, like, hey, if you're a nice person and you pray this thing in my name, I'll give you a million bucks. Deeply saddens me. They misunderstand who Jesus is. But what grieves me the most is the vexing, polarized, political Jesus that the world thinks Jesus, is, Jesus hates gays, hates the LGBT community, hates immigrants, hates Muslims. 
that grieves me the most, that people can misunderstand the greatest person who walked on this earth. And now more than ever is this generation so divided over the person of Jesus, misunderstanding who Jesus is. So how do we as a church, how do we as a faith community in the city of Fullerton, Brea, Yerba Belinda, La Mirada, La, La Habra, how do we as a church help this generation, this world, not misunderstand who Jesus truly is? I find it really timely that we've been going through the book of Mark for the past three weeks because it's in the book of Mark, we see and we, we see that Mark reveals who the Son of God actually is. So let's turn to the book of Mark together. You know, Mark is um, an incredibly fascinating book. You know, it doesn't get a lot of popularity. It's like, it's kind of seen as like the lesser cousin of the other, other two synoptic gospels, right? Matthew's longer, Luke's really long, and no one ever wants to read Luke. But Mark, it's short, and people think it's like less important. But Mark is a brilliant storyteller. If you know me, I love narrative. Narrative literature in the genre of the Bible is one of my favorites because it's not boring. <laughs> it's, it's, it's deeply emotional. It's dramatic. There's conflict. There's plot. And there's character development. And what Mark does in his storytelling ability is that he actually highlights these three groups of people. The first group of people that Mark highlights is categorized by how they respond in understand who Jesus is or misunderstands who Jesus is. And that group is the Pharisees and the scribes. Pharisees and scribes are other teachers of the law, other religious leaders, and, and they would respond to Jesus when he would be teaching or when he would be doing a healing or a miracle or, or casting out a demon. These, these rulers, these teachers of the law would respond antagonistically to Jesus because they viewed him as an adversary. They viewed him as as a threat, as another teacher, like who, who is this guy trying to challenge status quo? They saw him as a zealot, as an activist. They deeply and profoundly misunderstood who Jesus was. The second group that Mark highlights is that we call, it, we call them the crowd. And these people, they, they respond to Jesus. They're, they're in the crowd. They're in the home. They're at the field. And Jesus is teaching. And he's doing a miracle. He's feeding 5,000. He's feeding 4,000. He's casting out demons. He's healing the blind. He's healing the sick. And what is, what is the crowd response? How do they respond? They respond they resound with amazement. It actually repeats over and over in these micro stories in Mark. They, they, they respond with astonishment in some of your Bibles, it says. But the problem is, they're amazed and they're astonished, but they, but they don't do anything about it. They do nothing. Because they just see Jesus as, he's the new magician on the block. He's the new miracle worker on the block. He's the hottest thing right now, just like any other. And then Mark has this third group of people called the disciples. The disciples are the ones that Jesus handpicked in the beginning of the book of Mark. And they're the insiders. They're the ones that Jesus hand chose to follow him for three years to learn from him. It actually says this in Mark chapter four. It'll be up on the screen. Jesus is teaching in parables. He teaches in, in these cryptic stories that no one really understands. But he says this to his disciples. He's like, hey, you know how I teach them these stories? This is what Jesus says to them. To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you, actually, the, all the interpretations of these parables that I, that I teach that no one understands. But for the outsider, everything's going to be in parables. They're not going to understand it. And it's fascinating what Jesus says next. They may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand. So, 
you would, you would expect that the disciples respond to Jesus with bold courage and conviction. You would, you would think that Mark highlights the disciples as these people that they get it right. They're the insiders. They know the secrets of the kingdom of God, right? Utterly wrong. The disciples are afraid, terrified, confused. They have no idea who Jesus truly is. How do I know that? Again, Mark is a brilliant, beautiful storyteller. He isolates three scenes in the book of Mark. We call them the boat scenes. There's three boat scenes in the book of Mark where Jesus has an isolated conversation or interaction with the disciples. And they're, they're given an opportunity to prove if they truly understand who Jesus is. And the first boat scene, it's a very, very famous story. We, we learned about it a couple weeks ago, is the calming of the storm. There's a storm, and the disciples are fearing for their life. They think they're going to die, and they say, Rabbi, teacher, master, we're going to die. Don't you care? And Jesus just calmly gets up, and he just, you know, <laughs> be quiet, be still. And the, and the, st the disciples are like, they're still trembling. Terrible. Who is this man that can just speak to the sea and calm it? And Jesus looks at them and is like, why are you so afraid? In the second boat scene, Jesus just feeds 5,000 people, and the disciples go out in the boat in the lake, and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to catch up with you later. And what Jesus does is he, uh, he's like, I don't need a boat. He just, just walks on the water. <laughs> he's walking to them, you know, and the disciples are like, oh, my God. They're terrified. They think they see a ghost. And then Jesus says, take courage. Don't be afraid. It's just me. And Jesus is like, why are, why are you so afraid? Don't you, don't you know who I am? I'm, don't you know who I am? Don't you get it? And later, Mark reveals that they didn't get it. They had no idea what it meant when Jesus fed the 5,000 and broke the bread because their hearts were hardened. The third and final boat scene where, they, where the disciples have an opportunity to show if they truly understand Jesus is they're in the boat. They just, Jesus just fed 4,000. So walking on water, he's fed 5,000. Now he just fed 4,000. They're in the boat again. Mind you, the disciples saw Jesus feed 5,000 and 4,000. And now they have this discussion about, we don't have any bread. We don't have enough bread. And they're in the boat, and they're like, oh, did you bring the bread? Did you bring, we don't have enough bread. How are we going to feed the next city? How are we going? And then Jesus is like, he like has it up to here, right? Jesus is like, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Very cryptic thing. I won't go into too much detail what that meant. But he just says this thing, and the disciples are like, look at him. And they just talk about the bread again. We don't have enough bread. What, what is Jesus talking about? We don't have enough bread. We need to get more bread. And Jesus, this is his response. This is, what, this is what Jesus says. Why are you discussing the fact that we have no bread? <laughs> Forgive my, my overly dramatic reading. I'm Korean. We're overly dramatic. <laughs> and, and this is, check this out. Check this out, right? So Jesus, remember what he said in chapter 4 here as he's teaching parables He's saying, to, he's saying to his disciples, to you has been given the secrets of the kingdom. You're the insider. The outsider, what did, what did Mark say? Is in parables. For they indeed see, but do not perceive. They hear, but do not understand. What does Jesus say to these disciples in the third scene? Do you not yet perceive Or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Why? The disciples, they're supposed to be the insider, the reader. 
Understanding that Mark is telling a literary story, character development, you're expecting the, the disciples to get it right as the protagonists. They're the, one that, they're the ones that, that truly understand who Jesus is. They, they're going to respond rightly as boldly. No, they, they don't get it. It's ironic that the insider is the outsider. Why? But to their credit, to their credit, what Mark does in the story is that he does this weird thing where Jesus is constantly trying to suppress and conceal his true identity. He keeps it a secret. It's such a secret that Jesus, when he's talking about himself, he talks in third person. You know those weird people that talk in third person? But they don't use his name. He, he, he says, the Son of Man does this. The Son of Man is like this. And it's when, you, when you're the reader and when you're the disciples, you're like, is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? Or is he talking about someone in the past? Or is he talking about someone to come? You just, you can't figure it out. I mean, we know that he's talking about himself. <laughs> And so Jesus does this thing. He's like concealing it. Son of man, son of man, son of man. And then the reader, you're like, wait, aren't you the son of God? But Jesus is calling himself the son of man in third person. Those who study the book of Mark, we call this the messianic secrecy, right? Messianic secret. And a lot of ink is spilled on this topic in the book of Mark. But you know why I think Mark does that? Mark does that because there are these other scenes where Mark makes it so clear who Jesus truly is. Yeah, you guessed it. There are three scenes where Mark reveals Jesus' true identity as the Son of God. Mark chapter 1, it's at his baptism. Jesus gets baptized, and the sky rips open, and a voice came from heaven saying, What? You are my beloved son. The second revelation, the revealing of Jesus, who he truly is, is what your Bibles would, would title the transfiguration. No one knows what that means. But it's when he takes his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, he takes them up to the mountain and he does like this, right, reveals himself. And they got all scared. But what happens in that scene is that a voice came out of the cloud saying what? This is my beloved son. This is my son. This is my beloved son. Moments where Jesus' true identity is divinely affirmed and confirmed. But the tension that you feel in the narrative in the book of Mark is that no human knows yet. No human gets it right. Not even the disciples get it right. They're still talking and arguing about bread. Well, it's funny because the third and final scene of Revelation, a human being finally confesses who Jesus truly is. It was when Jesus died on the cross. He was crucified. And he breathed his last breath. And you would think he was a disciple with him. But as a reader, it's scandalous who uttered the words and confessed. The first human person in the book of Mark. Who is it? It's a Roman centurion, his executioner, the enemy of the cross. And when Mark highlights this centurion be the one saying, when he watches Jesus die and Jesus breathes his last breath, the centurion, he confesses and says, truly this man was the Son of God. And as the reader, you're like, what? What is going on? Why? What is, you're, you're, you're at this place because what Mark is doing is that it's in this moment, it's in this scene that you, tr you truly understand who Jesus is. Fundamentally, you cannot understand the person of Jesus 
without the cross. It is the apex of the entire story. It's the apex of the entire book. And the confession is scandalous that a Roman officer who executed Jesus is the one that confesses, the first one. And it brings our attention that Jesus, the Son of God, it's realized as the reader of something that Jesus said and something that Jesus has been trying to explain the entire book of Mark. And Jesus says this, I came not to be served, but to serve, to give my life as a ransom for many. See, when you see the Roman confess that truly this is the Son of God, it's a pivotal moment when you read the book of Mark. And it confirms and affirms what Jesus has been trying to say the entire time. How do we, how do we, how do we help this world, this generation, this city, not misunderstand who Jesus is? How do we help them not not, un, not misunderstand that Jesus is this fairy tale, folklore, fictional myth. How do we help them not understand, how do we help them not misunderstand that, that Jesus is, is not this self-help guru or Jesus is my homeboy or Jesus is, is, this, is this Santa Claus who just, who just gives everything I want as long as I pray in his name and I'm a nice person. How do we show the world? How do we teach the world? How do we exemplify to the world that Jesus is not anti-everything? How? It's when we take the words of our Lord and Savior very, very seriously when he says, I did not come to be served. I came to serve and give my life for others. It's when you and me, we live out self-sacrificial service that points people to the cross. That is how we'll show the world who Jesus truly is. I see it every day, actually, in my wife Eunice. Since the day we got married, she has been so servant-hearted and self-sacrificial. And I'm not just talking about the wifely duties of cooking my favorite meals and cleaning my mess and organizing my clothes, but I I'm, extremely, um, I'm extremely what we call HM, high maintenance emotionally. <laughs> I have swings. There, there are times I get deeply just depressed and discouraged. Eunice, that sermon sucked. <laughs> and she's just, she's just with me. She listens to me. She listens to me complain. She empathizes with me. She supports me. And then when, I, when, I, when I'm so, you know, when I'm dreaming and I'm so ambitious to change the world, I'm like, Eunice, let's just, let's, let's hang this up. Let's just go and be missionaries in Japan or China or North Korea. They're like, but we might die there. Like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> but Eunice says, okay, when? Let's pack our bags. Not only does she point me to the cross as a wife, but she points me to the cross when I see how, how she serves as a mother to my son. To this day, my son, who is over one years old, does not sleep longer than three hours at night. I know, we're trying to figure out what we did wrong, okay? <laughs> we're, I know, we're just trying to figure it out. First time parents, okay? Um, we're trying to figure it out. But every night, I wake up alone. Where is she? And I do the same thing. I walk to my son's room, and I see her there in his crib. She 
She's 90 pounds. <laughs> She's laying with him. And I'm like, man, when is this, when is this girl had a good night's sleep, you know? She works full time at Biola. She packs our son's snacks for daycare. She packs my lunch. She cooks breakfast for the family and works full time. I mean, Adam, you're, you're her boss. You know she is the most self-sacrificial, servant-hearted person. I know. But ultimately, I see it in the way that she serves her parents. That's what really did it for me. That's what I married her. Since she was 18, she had to financially kind of support herself through college. Her parents were, and her family was in a tough financial spot, so she took out debt to pay the bills, to pay the Sprint phone bill, to pay the cable bill. She would buy groceries for her parents. She didn't even have a, have a car. Her sister had a Mercedes, but she didn't have a car. <laughs> and from Westwood, we, we went to UCLA, she would take the bus from West LA all the way downtown to her job. She would go home, clean the house, cook for them. And to be honest, when I observed that when we were dating, I, I felt that she was greatly underappreciated and severely taken advantage of. It, it got to a point almost before we were married that she wanted to completely cut ties with her parents because it was just too hard. It's just too hard. But this year, we decided to move in with them. And every single person that we told that to said, you're gonna regret it. <laughs> it's gonna mess everything up. Don't do it. Don't do it. And to be honest with you, we know. We know it's not a wise decision. But we prayed, my wife and I, and I saw her heart. We prayed and we feel called to sacrificially serve them in this season. Because we want to live cross-shaped lives. We want to live lives that point people to the cross and that Jesus is so much more that he's a servant, that he sacrifices for those he loves and for those he doesn't love or who doesn't love him. Now imagine if this place, what would it look like if the city of Fullerton, Brea, La Mirada, Yorba Linda, that, that this place wasn't just known for our beautiful facility and campus, that it wasn't just known for the amazing choir and orchestra concerts that we put on. And to be quite honest with you, that it's not just known for an amazing Bible teacher years ago, but that this place would be known that they truly show who the Son of God is, that Jesus Christ is a servant who gave his life as a ransom for many, gave his life for the sins of the world, by how we sacrificially serve one another, our families, our spouses, our church groups, our church families, and ultimately the city. Evie Free, let's show the world, let's show this city who the Son of God truly is by our sacrificial love. Let's pray. Father, we ask you in this time to bless our time. We pray that your spirit would convict and stir in us your word that we would see Jesus more than a teacher, that we would see Jesus more than a story, 
but that Jesus gave his life. Jesus was a servant. And that we as followers of him can show the world who that person truly is. Help us to do that in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.